going on, guys? It is Brian and Jack with Simple Man's Comics, and we have a very special episode of that Indie Spotlight series for you. Everyone knows Jack and I are big fans of independent comics, not only independent comics, but we are fans of Mad Cave Studios, and we have a great talent with us tonight. We have the author slash writer, however you want to call it, of that hit Mad Cave title, Over the Ropes. You know Jack and I are also wrestling fans, and the writer of this book is a wrestling fan as well. I want to introduce to you guys, Jay Sandlin. Hey, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> so, Jay, if you don't, you need to follow him on Twitter. That guy's one of the most active people on Twitter. And he's one of those guys we always talk about that responds to people. He's not one of those creators that doesn't reach back out to you. He's happy to answer questions, always reaching out to people. But Jay, you write over the ropes. You write Mad Cave. You write a lot of other stuff, too. Why don't you tell us? A little bit about your background, how you got into comics. Just let the viewers know who Jay Sandlin is. Thanks, Brian. Well, I am a writer, like you said. I am the creator of Over the Ropes, the uh, 90s wrestling series running for Mad Cave Studios right now. I have uh, written other comics. Uh, my next one coming out is in March. That's going to be Hellfighter Quinn, the uh, fantasy blood sport martial arts tournament with uh, some monsters, cyborgs, and uh, the Hellfighter vigilante of Harlem. Uh, just all coming together for some good old-fashioned uh, blood and guts violence. Uh, I've got a, a novel a short story collection that's out right now, actually on Amazon. You can pick that up, Space Police Files, which is five irreverent, uncensored, and unredacted uh, case files, eyewitness accounts from the space police uh, in the most effed up sectors of the Milky Way. So uh, check that out. It just came out less than a week ago as of this recording. So leave a review because that's something authors really appreciate. And of course, like you said, I've got uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I try to be as active as uh, the guest at a wrestling wedding. Uh, so make sure you are always busting in there and making appearances on my social media. Uh, Jay Sandlin underscore WHN. My podcast, Jay Sandlin's What Happens Next, uh, normally features other creators and uh, writers, artists, and people, you know, trying to just tell their own stories and maybe trying to inspire others who might be trying to do the same. Oh, and occasionally we talk about superhero matchups too, you know, no big deal. So Jay, I want to talk to you a little bit about Over the Ropes. We're, what, two issues in right now. Fantastic. I'm telling you, the viewer, if you guys are a fan of those that 90s style wrestling, to me, it kind of reminds me of a mashup of me growing up, t TBS, when shows all the shows started at like five minutes after the hour, 7.05 p.m., but it reminds me a little bit of TBS WCW with some WWF. I hope we don't get sued for saying that, but that's what it was back then, combined with some of these storylines, some of these characters. Um, they are, you see similarities from what you're used to especially watching wrestling, so you naturally portray or project that while you're reading the story. It's just natural for the reader to do. Was some of that on purpose? And were you a fa I take it you were a big fan of that wrestling era as well. You can take it the right way. So when Mad Cave and I first talked about working together, they said, uh, we think that you would be the right person uh, for a wrestling comic. And I, I said, well, you're absolutely right. Yes, but why do you think that? And they said, well, we've just seen on social media that you talk about wrestling and seem to know a lot about it. So for people who say that uh, talking about wrestling on social media is a waste of time, uh, in the words of DX, suck it. Because <laughs> uh, it, it got me hired. And I, from there, um, like you said, writing the story, I had to decide when it was going to take place and I decided on the 90s because, A, that's a time a lot of people associate with wrestling. You could call it a boom period, no doubt. And it's the time I probably associate most with wrestling. Because uh, like you said, I'm from the South. I live in Alabama. The TBS and the Superstation, TNT, all very big sources of, of wrestling down here where uh, Jim Crockett ran shows and then later Ted Turner purchased uh, what became WCW. 
and ran his programs head to head with the WWF. And you mentioned characters. And that's really what wrestling was in the early 90s. People, it, they weren't like people. They were, they were just characters. You had, you know, everyone had a job. You had like a fireman or you were, you know, the repo man. Um, Max Moon was from space for some reason. And, and you would see these characters and you didn't know why these, you know, characters would decide to be wrestlers. You know, why is there an undead zombie wizard called the Undertaker that's out here wrestling? but you, you loved it. So yeah, I was definitely trying to capture that with uh, Over the Ropes and the whole theme because I thought that would work well with a comic book. Well, and I especially like the way that it weaves in and out of, and we're going to get real kind of wrestling terminology here, but in and out of like kayfabe where there's moments where you're, you're almost, as you're reading it, you're following along the storyline of SFW and then at the same time, you're following along the story that you're presenting in Over the Ropes. Uh, was that something that you set out to do? Is that something that's going to go throughout the series um, as we follow kind of our main character? Um, yes and yes. <laughs> yes! 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 Uh, yes, it was something I set out to do. And uh, another backstage uh, tidbit the original title that I proposed for the series, uh, what you might call the working title for me, was Kayfabe. Really? I thought about calling the comic Kayfabe. Um, yep. I'm glad they went with Over the Ropes. That was better. But uh, yeah, and that was the reason I went with that was because the best storylines for me growing up were the ones where you didn't know if it was a work or a shoot. Oh, without a doubt. Still you to know? this day. To this day, yeah. Because we, we know that wrestling is this predetermined, scripted television program that probably has more in common with Game of Thrones than it does the Olympics. But if there's a segment or a, you know, a story that can make you say, well, all that other stuff is fake, but that was real, then I think it succeeded. So yeah, that was why um, you mentioned SFW which stands for Southern Fried Wrestling, and that is the name of the wrestling promotion that the, uh, the, the story follows. Um, yeah, I actually wanted the, uh, the real drama to be crazier than the stuff happening for the crowd in the ring was, was the goal that you, the reader, get to see. Yeah, and it's great to read, especially if you're a wrestling fan, because as you're reading it, stuff that's out unfolding in the comic book, you instantly relate to stuff you know from growing up watching wrestling. It's like you see so many parallels there, like um, we were talking about before where I was like, oh yeah, that's Vince McMahon and his, his, his snobby little son. If you look at it from kayfabe, you know, <laughs> Shane McMahon, Shane O'Mac. And then I was like, so you naturally pull the parallels that you know while you're reading the story. So it kind of expands on the story in your own mind while you're reading it. You're seeing it great here, but you're also thinking about everything that's played out from what you've seen when you've watched wrestling, it's like, oh yeah, this is Sting. But then as the story progresses in the comic book, you're like, wait a minute, maybe this isn't Sting. Maybe this is, and then you start relating it to another wrestler as the character grows within the book. And then like, same with the heels or the baby face. It's like, when you first see him, you identify him as a wrestler that you're aware of. And then as the story changes, you start going, oh no, now, that's, now it's this wrestler and now it's this wrestler. So two issues in, I'm hooked. And then, Issue number two ends with the little cliffhanger saying, next issue, screw job. So instantly you think, Montreal screw job, at least to me I do. You should. <laughs> you absolutely should. And the, uh, the titles for, um, so let's see, the first issue um, is called Phoenix Rising, by the way, which I don't know if that title ever actually appears on the issue. And Phoenix Rising is the main character, Phoenix, um, as he becomes. That's the name of his finishing maneuver, which uh, I took as the I took the uh, shooting star press, uh, made famous by probably guys like Juice and Thunder Liger and uh, Billy Kidman, and I, I gave that move to him um, because I thought a high flyer, which I always loved watching high flyers, uh, you, you know, in wrestling, what some people call them spot monkeys or you know put them down, but I, I think they're some of the most entertaining. Um, 
I, I decided it would be more fun in a comic book to focus on a high flyer because it's almost like the, a superhero quality to it. Yeah. So yeah, and then we've got uh, this most recent issue, number two, that came out was called uh, One Night Feud uh, to kind of relate to when two wrestlers are put in a program together for just one night to you know do it and then move on to the next thing, which is what we're going to do in issue three, screw job. <laughs> well, and that's one of the things that I like where, Brian, you talked about invoking certain memories or, or kind of comparisons as you read it. I live in South Carolina. I kind of love the Southern territory feel of it where, especially in issue two, where you kind of go into a new town um, your opponent is a guy you're not necessarily familiar with, but it's a guy who's used to kind of beat up the guy who needs to be taught a lesson. Um, <laughs> that, that, that whole story, uh, that it may be set in the nineties, but it has a serious eighties feel because you, you hear so many stories from wrestlers about how things were done in the territory days where they didn't have TV cameras following them everywhere they went. There wasn't. You're right. Yeah. So, and you know, a you're guy absolutely would get a right. <laughs> guy would get a receipt if he if he if he uh, stepped out of line as Phoenix does. I don't know how spoiler you want to get, but in issue one, and if you said Phoenix, you look at like Sting and people like that. And yes, I see the visual comparison, but I think one of the things that resonates the most for me is the fact that he was a jobber. Another yeah. in real wrestling term here, but he was a guy who lost all the time. Um, put other people over. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and through certain circumstances that sometimes do happen in wrestling, but is very infrequent. A guy ascends that ladder that quickly um, where then now suddenly he's in the main event. Um, and I think that that makes it more intriguing to follow. And I also agree with what you said about the high flyer. I think that's why the high flyer in that role works so perfectly because he's the automatic underdog against the heavyweights, the bigger guys um, that he's had to face so far in the issue. And I think that that allows you to pull for him no matter how he went about getting that title. Wouldn't, wouldn't we all just like to screw our bosses one day? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, it seems like we're into spoilers, so why not? Yeah, in the first issue, the the whole um, the twist is Phoenix, you know, goes into business for himself. And uh, he wins the title, but not the way he was supposed to. You know, in real life, he would have just been fired, most likely. Yeah. But yeah. You know, we, it's a comic, so we got we, we got to carry it forward. Actually, and you mentioned it had a feel of the '80s, which the book takes place in 1992. I was gonna say it seems like yeah. right before the Attitude Era, and right that before, was my, right, yeah, right before the territories shut down. Yep. Right, that when, was exactly uh, what I wanted. Right before yeah. that Wild West feel was, it was on its way out. You could Crow see Sting. what was coming. <laughs> Crow Sting, um, yeah, 96 was Crow Sting, but um, in looking for a, a, the right look for uh, Jason when he becomes Phoenix, uh, we looked at a lot of um, concept art that I put together, because uh, another behind the scenes thing, so with Mad Cave, uh, the artist, the letterist, the colorist, as far as I know, I know the artist and the editor didn't know anything about wrestling. Wow. <laughs> So I, I had to not only write the book, I had to write a little guide. Like, here's a glossary of terms for the ones we were just going over. Jobber, you know, um, work, shoot, et cetera. I, I wrote a whole glossary for him. and said, this is what I mean. And uh, in issue two, there's a dog collar match. And our editor is um, a wonderful woman named Gio. Uh, from Colombia, who, when we first met over Skype, she told me she didn't know anything really about wrestling. I said, well, you're, you're going to learn. And when the dog collar match script got to her, she, she wrote back and she's like, do people really do this? Like, has this happened? <laughs> Are they trying to kill each other for real? <laughs> that, that's what makes us watch. Right. <laughs> that's what makes us, yeah, keep watching. Yes. Yeah. We like those terms like blading and <laughs> stuff yeah. like that. There we go. We got a strap match coming uh, this weekend at yeah. the Royal Rumble with Daniel Bryan and uh, Bray Wyatt. Yep. Mm. Yeah. And I they like just that. had the bare the bare fist the bare knuckle match with Big Show and yep. the Messiah. <laughs> We're gonna need that. Yeah, it's all better than Judy Bagwell on a forklift. Oh my God! Yes. 
So issue one is basically um, Phoenix betraying the boss and getting the getting the belt. And not only get the belt, but you know, he gets he gets a he gets a loud pop, right? So that's another reason why, you know, the boss can't just go. He's fired because it's business also, so you gotta keep the business going. So in the second issue, that's when uh, Jack was talking about where they basically hire um I, I call him the honky tonk man because that's kind of what he reminded me of, right? He's an Elvis impersonator. And that's the guy that Jack was talking about that they hired basically just to teach a lesson. And um, that comes into the match there where he's uh, supposed to take him out and teach him a lesson, right? The bounty hunter. Yes, he is. Uh, I love the book to... that references in the book too. <laughs> okay. Specifically, that was with uh, Blue Bomba, my, my luchador yeah. character. <laughs> yeah. He, he tells him, uh, or when he tells him there's a bounty hunter, he says, um, what, the buckethead guy from Star Wars is coming at me? And his, his Mexican wrestling friend who always wears his mask, Lou Bamba, says, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, Mexican, you know, or Spanish, he says, he, su nombre es Boba Fett. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a line they cut out after that where, uh, where Phoenix calls him a nerd for knowing that. <laughs> I don't know why they cut that line. I guess it was space. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like we said, we're leading up to the Montreal screw job. But this is a good part where we, when we're talking on Twitter, you were like, hey, did you pick out any Easter eggs from the first two issues? And I kind of jotted down like the real obvious ones. And I thought I was all smart about it. And I sent him over to Jay. And he's like, he's like, yeah, that's pretty good. But let me expand on it. And he, he's got a bunch of Easter eggs here that we kind of want to talk about. And, um, Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm sure I will fully admit Jack is more wrestling than I am. I consider myself a fan. I consider Jack like the dude probably, he like sleeps with a belt. <laughs> and stuff. But um, either way, so we got some Easter eggs that we're going to talk about. And if you're, if you're the viewer, our wrestling fans, let us know in the comments if, if you identified any of these, especially, I mean, and if you haven't been reading over the ropes and you enjoy wrestling or if, you don't enjoy wrestling, it's still a great story. But I'm dragging on here. We're going to get into these Easter eggs, right, Jay? Let's do it. So without further ado, we are going to introduce right now the top 10 Easter eggs in the Over the Ropes comic series so far. And that first one we're going to talk about is the working man, man's man. So in the opening sequence of issue one, the uh, opening match they have in Phoenix's hometown of Radisonville, Alabama, uh, Jason Lynn, before he becomes the Phoenix, is working as a jobber, and he's dressed like Bob the Builder or, or a construction worker. And this was, uh, I had in mind as a reference to a very short-lived gimmick played by William Regal, the man's man which has one of my favorite theme songs jack i'm sure you agree oh yes <laughs> i remember i remember the dude. uh the titan tron video he's a man <laughs> such a man yeah Th so that was uh that was the reference to the working man to show that uh phoenix was not in a role that fit him much like william regal was at the time right now, I will say also, we've discussed it before, how the, the, the era of wrestling that this takes place. So if you're a newer viewer, or newer into wrestling, and you're only few, used to the current wrestling, if you have like the WWE network app, a lot of these older matches are on there, or the documentaries, you can go back and watch some of these to get some of these Easter eggs, get some of that feel of what wrestling was like. When, when, when I was younger, I'll just say I was younger. I don't know what you guys' age. I think with social media now, we're in like this reality wrestling era where, you know, you want to try to blur that line, um, but you, it's difficult because everybody sees you outside of the ring. So you've got these characters based with their real names, right? You've got, or, or names that are supposed to be their real names. Um, so you have a, guys like, you know, even even over the top characters they're naming things like roman reigns it's still supposed to be a first name and a last name and a seth rollins um and you know you talked earlier about those kind of gimmicks of the 90s and 80s and junkyard was, dog man it was like the occupational gimmick era where it was like every every blue collar job had to be represented in a wrestler it was as if um the mcmahon's felt like 
if they had a garbage man, then the garbage men of America would then support WWF wrestling um, and, and be fans. So you had kind of every job. And it seemed like when a guy would leave the company and that occupation no longer had a job, it was almost as if they were like, okay, well, we need a new this or we need a new that. And they would just slot a guy in there. So much as you had Kane um, prior to being Kane, being, of course, Isaac Yankum, the dentist. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it was that, that level of um, kind of ridiculousness at, at that time. But um, we've moved in, past in my head In my head canon, Isaac Yankum is Britt Baker's father. <laughs> and it's funny because, like you said, every wrestler is a blue-collar job except for Shane McMahon, who's – the brat son of the owner with his little posse. But we're going to get to the next Easter egg here. And the next one is Mr. Radisson slash Mr. McMahon. You know, we love the idea of the crooked promoter. And Mr. McMahon is the best hands-down wrestling villain in history. <laughs> his the, the strut. <laughs> it was me, Austin. It was me all along. Yeah. And it's what drove the Attitude Era. So when I was thinking of a villain for Over the Ropes, I, I came up with Ramblin' Ricky Radisson, who is a wrestler. Um, in looks, he more he looks more like a Rick Rude type, or uh, maybe even Dan Severin. He's a tough guy. He is from the old school. He is from the territories. And now that his career in the ring has come to an end. He is going into the promoting, and he wants to take the SFW company all the way to the top, kind of like Vince McMahon did when he took over the WWF during the territory systems. Um, I think the difference between them is, you know, Vince played a much more evil character on screen. Ricky play it is a much more evil character behind the scenes. It, it, you'll see as the story goes on. So that was number two, Mr. Radisson, Mr. McMahon. Which I think is also very reminiscent of the time when those territories started to shut down. Every promoter knew the writing was on the wall. You had to secure a TV deal. And you started to see, um, for a brief period of time, you know, we had wrestling on ESPN. You had your Mid-South. You had wrestling um, kind of on several different channels. And then over time, it dwindled down until we had uh, you know, just WCW, WWE, but uh, I, I think that's where, when he's talking about that in the, I think it's the first issue where Ricky's talking about, you know, trying to get that TV deal, um, I, that almost, not desperation, but kind of feeling of, we need to make this work, it, this has to, we need to be able to pass on. And he's betting, the yeah, guy. he has invested everything into yep. getting that TV deal, so what will he do? <laughs> right. You'll find out. Next Easter egg we're getting into is titled Buddy Peacock slash Daniel Bryan. This is my yes. favorite one. Okay. So it, this is getting a little obscure. And that's why Jack likes it, I think. Yeah. yeah. And no, number three over Easter egg here. Um, there's been a passing mention of a character, a wrestling champion by the name of Buddy Peacock. And in 1992, over the ropes world, Buddy is the current world champion of the big promotion, AWF. They're, they're the big guys. They're the competition. And he was Ricky Radisson's primary rival when they were wrestlers. They were very much, in my mind, the flair and steamboat of the day. Uh, in issue two, Jason mentions that he wore out several videotapes of their matches growing up because he loved their wrestling. So that was uh, kind of like the, in the Carolinas, Flair and Steamboat wrestled series all over the place. So I imagine that they had a whole classic series of matches. But um, where I got the name Buddy Peacock, aside from it just sounding nice and flamboyant, it was originally uh, an NXT developmental wrestler name for one Brian Danielson, also known as Daniel Bryan. And uh, it kind of got far. Like they were, they were talking Buddy Peacock, and then it was actually William Regal who suggested the name Daniel Bryan. Yeah, you know, right. probably because he remembered being the man's man and did not want to see Daniel saddled with uh, Buddy Peacock. Because what what would they have done to Daniel Bryan if he had been Buddy Peacock? 
maybe there's an alternate earth somewhere that he did debut as Buddy Peacock and probably got fired faster than Adam Rose. I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the things that WWE, I'll give them some credit for. They've gotten better at is the terrible names. When NXT first started, you would take a guy who had gotten so much fame on the independent scene, or even worse than that, in like Japan. And then you'd almost disrespect that by throwing a whole new name on them, um, giving them a whole new identity. And then you're trying to get people acclimated to that name. Um, and they had some bad ones over the years. One thing I've seen is you can't let them pick your name. You have to be very active in that whole role or else Daniel Bryan to this day could be Buddy Peacock. And, you know, it, it, Brian Danielson was one of the most famous wrestlers in the world. So it was such a, it's such a nice compromise just to switch the last name and the first name, but it, it could have gone really bad, really fast. Yeah. And then the next or the number four Easter egg we're going to talk about is SFW NWA. So we talked already about some of this territory wrestling, you know, that was all the rage until the cable TV networks really changed the game you had to have the cable TV program if you wanted to land the TV deals and survive. So in the Over the Ropes universe, you've got the AWF as the reigning wrestling promotion in the USA with world champion Buddy Peacock. And Mr. Radisson formed SFW. Um, I, this, is, this is kind of alluded to, but you, you only get so many pages in comics. But after Ricky, um, while Ricky was famous and, you know, after he in my mind, became a spokesperson like Dave Thomas for a KFC-style franchise. And he took that money and started SFW. So this is much like the Jim Crockett promotions or Smoky Mountain Wrestling, these um, you know territories in the early 90s that were trying to directly compete with the big guys. So how's that going to go for SFW? Uh, you'll have to keep reading to find out. I love that name too, Southern Fried Wrestling. <laughs> that was another. Uh, that was another name I suggested for the book's title. Actually, yeah. Again, I'm glad they picked over the ropes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just a key name, especially for the whole premise, the whole the area. Like you're just discussing there with the territories of wrestling. Southern. You would you would know it's a you know you would know it's a, a wrestling book and that it takes place in the South, which every book's going to go to a different town, much like mm -hmm. in the territories. You were in a new town every week. Then our fifth Easter egg we're going to talk about, we kind of hinted at this also, but Jesse Presley slash Honky Tonk Man. So yeah, we mentioned the bounty hunter from issue two, Jesse Presley. He is the guy looking to teach Phoenix a lesson. Um, you probably already guessed that I named him after Elvis's twin brother who uh, passed away in childbirth, Jesse Presley. And many people like like Brian have pointed out, yes, he's a lot like the honky tonk man. Really, they're both just Elvis impersonators, so that they both ripped off the same guy. Um, the honky tonk man, of course, is known for being a very long reigning intercontinental champion and being Eric Bischoff's favorite person to fire. Um, but uh, Jesse, uh, the character I wrote as a combination of uh, Honky Tonk Man meets Yokozuna. Uh, Yokozuna being one of the bigger guys who was actually a Samoan uh, who played a Japanese sumo wrestler. So, you know, Vince said he had enough Samoans running around, so he made him a sumo wrestler, and Yoko became one of the great world champions in the 90s. So I wanted that same size, physique, and imposing nature like Yokozuna for the bounty hunter character. And then since it was going to be in the South, I thought we could go to Memphis. And I thought, why not a Yokozuna size Elvis impersonator? And um, in Jesse's flashback, they show in issue two, he trained to be a sumo wrestler. So that was a, that was a Yokozuna slash honky tonk man with a little bit of... Um, bounty hunting in that easter egg yeah now that you mentioned the, the the sumo part of the comic it makes sense but when i was thinking of the size i i thought i was thinking earthquake <laughs> i was thinking honky tonk man slash earthquake just earthquake of... did a lot of stuff in japan too mm -hmm. so yeah that fits as well earthquake huge guy tugboat 
the shop master. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching it going, if this guy can wrestle, I can wrestle. <laughs> but moving on to our number six Easter egg, we're talking about the legend killer, Billy Radisson. All right, so this is going to be a two-part one. Um, Billy Radisson is uh, the other villain. He's Roll Tide, Billy Radisson. He is the son of Ricky Radisson, second-generation star. He has got a privileged attitude, self-entitled, and I, I really uh, drew on Randy Orton for kind of his look and his attitude, you know, the legend killer <laughs> gimmick. Yep. Uh, he's, he's a former football player. He's looking to take down a top star to cement his name, which was the whole legend killer gimmick. And uh, his father, Ricky, in the opening pages, uses the Orton pose. Yeah, it's so awesome. Which Orton actually got from Greek statues uh, of gods and athletes and heroes. So that's, a, that's an Easter egg of an Easter egg. Yeah, I don't know if I'm allowed to speak on Randy Orton since he's got me blocked on Twitter. <laughs> ah. You're in that, good company, I guess. Yeah, me and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> that that pose. If, if if Billy Radisson was on Twitter, he'd block your ass too. So <laughs> probably, <worry>. probably. <laughs> yeah. That that Randy Orton pose. I remember like when <clears throat> when he first when he was first doing it, watching it. I was like, what? what? I hated it. Like I couldn't stand it. But now when he gets up and does it, that's like I'm like enjoying it. But yeah, I see why. <laughs> I see why. Um, he's got a lot of people blocked on Twitter. My favorite version of Randy Orton is the legend killer though. And they went through and he beat Hulk Hogan and he beat all those, those older guys. I thought that was a, a really cool way to put him over. There. I don't think they ever like fully followed through on. I still think to this day, um, there's something to do with that. Or that's how he could go out is to have a younger guy kind of play on that legend killer thing with him. Now that he's the legend. The younger guy could kill him. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think is going to go on currently now with, with Randy Orton and the old Claymore kick? McIntyre. I I, I'm rooting for McIntyre because yeah, I think I'm he back. deserves that top sh – I think he deserves that top spot, so I'm rooting for him. Yeah, yeah the same way I was pro Jinder Mahal, one of the few. But, you know, yeah. I, think, I think when guys do it the right way, like a guy like Drew McIntyre or Jinder Mahal, like they hit – a rough road in their career they went on the indies do their thing come back go through the system um i think guys like that should be rewarded and given at least an opportunity to see what they can do in that top spot then the number seven easter egg we have titled marines in a bar so yeah awesome. bill billy radisson he also has uh, a lot in common with another young arrogant wrestler from the 90s uh, a young man known as the heartbreak kid, Sean Michaels, who, you know, is a great father and role model today, but even he will admit that was not the case at one time. And there's uh, in issue one, the whole reason that Phoenix gets to have a shot at the title is because Billy gets his ass kicked one night and can't perform for a while. And the, uh, the story of how Billy got injured is told by Ricky, who is an unreliable narrator. And he says that, you know, Billy got beat up by several Marines in a bar. And there was an event where Shawn Michaels was injured. And the story was he got beat up by some Marines in a bar, but, you know, he got some shots in and, you know, took several of them down before they just overwhelmed him. Um, sources vary. I don't know what the real story is, but the legend has been around of Shawn Michaels and the Marines in a bar. So uh, that was an Easter egg for, for Billy. Um, not just to be an Easter egg, but just to show how cocky he was. Is yeah, that he, also uh, leading into issue three? Yes, it will. His injury will. Um, you know, you saw him in issue two and he was on crutches yeah. and, you know, he still looked pretty rough. Um, that will lead into issue three. Yeah, the injury. Yeah, I've, I've got a chance to read the advanced uh, PDF of issue three from the good folks at Mad Cave Studios. And uh, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Quite the screw job. Quite. You're supposed to wait, Jack. You're supposed <laughs> to wait. Quite. <laughs> okay. But we're up to number eight. And number eight, we got Barbed Wire Brody Jackson slash 
hardcore legend. So yeah, Phoenix has a mentor. You know, every Rocky needs a Mickey. You got to have the wise old trainer. Save some for the sequel. And you kind of love him right off the bat. Okay, why did you love Barbed Wire right off the bat, by the way? Because uh, he has that kind of grizzled veteran who's still looking out for the younger guy kind of um, vibe about him, where it's like um, nothing in the story so far has been about himself. It's always been sort of a... Uh, looking out for mentoring and yeah especially a guy who's a jobber right a guy who's at the bottom um so you kind of dig him i kind i liked the moment where he kind of comes out to his defense yeah and trying to teach him the business you know, yeah like, he, he tries his best i mean and and you get the hint maybe that this is advice that he wishes he had followed when he yes. was younger and maybe didn't all the time um in appearance he looks a lot like the junkyard dog um mm-hmm. 70s and 80s megastar from the territories african-american trailblazer and he also has a trademark weapon a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire uh, that's been used by several wrestlers but probably most notably um mick foley and foley and barbed wire are the respective hardcore legends in their world um maybe a little bit of uh terry funk thrown in as well and i missed them I used to love terry I used to love to hate terry funk and what they all have in common is many years injuries and um bad decisions accumulated on their bodies which you'll you'll probably see more of that later too and then number nine we have blue bomba slash lucha libre 619 Boyaka Boyaka. <laughs> we did we talked a bit about Blue Bomba. Um li- little backstage story. I came up with Blue Bomba when I was maybe seven years old. Ah. Um I was trying to do a missile drop kick off the diving board, and I, I was pretending to be a lucha star, and I, I said I was uh the blue missile. So uh, cause I loved luchas, always loved um Juice and Thunder Liger, Ultimo Dragon, uh Rey Mysterio. Um, Hooventu, Guerrera, all those guys. Um, Blue Bomba is an amalgamation of a lot of them. Uh, but aside from his character trait of speaking only Spanish in public, he refuses to remove his mask anywhere in public. And uh, so far in issues one and two, he's been shown wearing it while he's uh, waiting tables at his day job. He's uh, had it while he's been sleeping, eating, and even in the shower. And there's really not a lot of exaggeration to that. Luchas take wearing the mask very seriously. Uh, One wrestler that really inspired that aspect of the story specifically was Mexican legend El Santo. And Santo was known to shower in his mask. Uh, He would not remove it for airport security unless he was in a private room. And he was the subject of many movies comics and other fame in mexico uh they also built a statue of him in mexico city i believe so a bit of a old school el santo reference there with blue bomba it's cool to see wrestlers of today still doing that i mean there's a storyline of prominence on monday night raw right now with Rey mysterio over the mask um yeah and andrade Andrade pulling the mask off although they've done that with Rey mysterio several several times um (laughs) over the years but you mentioned the lengths that these luchadors go one thing that i always think about is when a guy like kalisto will go to a wwe hall of fame event and he'll bring his wife his wife will wear a mask so that her identity um is also protected so you can't link back who this person is and i think that the the lengths that these guys go to protect their identities is absolutely amazing, especially in a world where everybody's all about themselves, right? Everybody's social promotion. And, uh, you know, these guys can almost walk around with anonymity uh, when they're not wearing their mask because that's that's what connects them to the audience. And like Sin Cara, it can make them easy to replace if you have to fire one. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We're through two Sin Caras already. Ah, who's counting? <laughs> yeah. And then the number 10 and final Easter egg we have is Phoenix slash face painters. So our main character, Phoenix, his real name is Jason, Jason Lynn. He decides at the end of issue one to be himself again, and he dons the Phoenix persona uh, to win the world title. 
and the Phoenix gimmick is a tribute to many of the face painted wrestlers that I just really loved. Uh, Sting was my favorite wrestler growing up and Sting uh, came up with the ultimate warrior, Jim Helwig. They were a tag team known as the Blade Runners and the Blade Runners were trying to copy the Road Warriors and also trying to copy the Road Warriors was Demolition, Powers of Pain, all these guys, even now we've got modern examples with the Ascension. Um, all these face painters served as an influence for Phoenix. And uh, there's a lot of the Road Warriors and Demolition in Phoenix. Uh, you'll even see that later. Um, the Road Warriors themselves were kind of ripping off Mad Max. So there's really nothing new under the sun. Um, one of the hardest things uh, in Over the Ropes for the artists to do was to keep track of who was wearing what wrestling attire, when and where. <laughs> and I actually, I wanted to change their attire a lot more often, but they they had to reel me in there a bit. They had to say, hey, uh, gets a little complicated. So uh, I was lucky enough to get three outfits for Phoenix. And you've only seen one so far. There's still two more to go. And I think when the, the last one comes out, you'll definitely see a strong uh, resemblance to one of the face-painted wrestlers I just named. So we, we're, we've been talking about territories and demolition, you mentioned. They're an example of a created tag team because of the territories, where the Road Warriors were out killing it going through territory, going through, uh, uh, they were NWA and they did uh, WCW for a while and WWE hadn't been able to bring them into the fold. So they just went and created their own version with demolition. Um, and you saw a lot of that um, back in the day. It'll be really interesting to see, to bring it to modern times as we sit here with WWE and AEW now in direct competition. Um, AEW has gone out of their way to say they don't want to be anything that duplicates WWE, but it'll be interesting to see if something really works with one company or the other, if the other company then tries to adopt kind of that same vibe or feeling. You see some of it though, like WWE has a street profits and um, AEW has, oh, what's their name again? I forget. It's basically almost just like the street uh, private party. Yeah. But I, but to, at the same time, I do like having, AEW, finally some competition with WWE now. I haven't been able to watch as much as AEW as I, I know you have. I mean, you've watched all the pay-per-views leading up to Dynamite. But yeah, I'm, I'm up to date until tonight, but I'll be watching. As soon as we're done here tonight, I've got my DVR to wrestling. It's Wednesday night, so yeah. we've got, we've got uh, um, AEW Dynamite, and we've got NXT. So it's a, that's my favorite. I think my favorite night of the week. So, and then one of the major draws to me to watch AEW is, of course, they got Chris Jericho over there. Speaking of Chris Jericho, you have like a bonus fact or bonus Easter egg about Chris Jericho, don't you? It, it, it's the dark Easter egg. It's, a, it's our dark match Easter egg. Um, the name Phoenix was almost a Chris Jericho gimmick. Um, you know, back when Chris Jericho was trying to make his name in the business, he was sending out press packets, you know, pre-internet, you would get together videos and eight by tens and, you know, resumes for yourself. And you would send it out about your gimmicks. And he was just trying to throw mud against the wall and see what would stick. Uh, according to his book, The Lion's Tale, um, his first book. And one of those gimmicks was the Phoenix. And it wasn't a face painter. It was a, uh, he found a bird mask in the garage uh, of a family that he was living with at the time because he was, you know, broke. And he used a hot glue gun to put some feathers on it. And he put together a bird mask, took some pictures of himself and sent it out as the Phoenix. So it was maybe almost kind of, sort of a Chris Jericho gimmick. Uh, we know that he has gone through a ton of gimmicks and reinventions. Um, He'd have made it work, right? He yeah. He, he, well, he, you know, he couldn't make everything work. He, he, he could not make the super lagger work. Wow. Uh, yeah. You can YouTube that if you want to see yeah. Chris Jericho bombs as super lagger. He's very embarrassed about it, I'm sure. But uh, in recent years, he donned the face paint um, with the alpha and the pain maker gimmick. 
And he, he proves above all that reinvention is the only constant in wrestling. So I always, I always tip the fedora to Chris Jericho. Um, uh, he's been one of my favorites of all time. A little bit of the bubbly. A little bit of the bubbly. So, I think his road to where he is now is why he's so good because he spent time in Mexico, because he spent time in Japan. Um, because and he, hosting he, game shows, he came. He came from, but that, but even the work outside of the wrestling business makes him so comfortable on a microphone. Um, he doesn't get intimidated. He just it, the ability to constantly reinvent, as you mentioned. He's, I think, he's almost underrated, no matter how much praise he gets, because he's never going to be a guy who's thought of when you say like top two or three wrestlers of all time. There's always going to people are always going to go the Hogan's and the flares and the steamboats. Um, um, and then he's going to be the same quality of weight. Like you see the, the, like the Miz projection going, I see Miz being Jericho type thing. Except Jericho has that world, more of that world title presence. Yeah. Uh, but I see what you mean though. Like Miz is one of those guys where we, we've talked about this before. Like he's a, he's a sure first ballot hall of fame type of guy. When you look at him like statistically, He's that the second most intercontinental titles of all time behind Jericho. Uh, he probably beats that record before it's all said and done. Um, he's been tag champion tons of times. He's main evented WrestleMania. He checks all the boxes, but he's always kind of going to be looked at in that second tier of wrestlers, if even that, because uh, there's a lot of people who just don't respect him to that same degree. Certainly not to the degree of Jericho. Yeah. I have huge respect for The Miz. Uh, we were talking about that before, especially because you know the man can sell mm-hmm. because he got to marry Maurice. You, you don't marry Maurice without, <laughs> without selling, being a good salesman. So yes. it's kind of like the, the DDP and Kimberly effect. You know, you, you look at DDP, you see who he's with, you say, yeah, that, that guy can sell. Um, DDP on AEW uh, just last week and the uh, past stuff, I've been really enjoying that stuff. Uh, Diamond cutter all around. Yes. <laughs> Those are the Easter eggs so far. Issue three. When does issue three come out? Issue three. Uh, where? What month is it now? Issue three will be out in February. So uh, be checking. You ask your local comic shop. Um, order online. However you prefer to get your comics. It'll be on Comixology, of course. Diamond. Um, you can go to madcavestudios.com order all five issues because you know it, it, it that's going to depend on if there will be a volume two one day maybe as and we of, want a volume two as yeah, of now sure. yeah as of now we don't know <laughs> it's so, like the thir- it's like the third man he doesn't exist until he walks out from the back room and we've talked about it on this channel a lot of times especially some of these great independent comics over the ropes great book i'm I think Jack and I like it also just because we're such diehard wrestling fans. But I think even if you weren't a wrestling fan, it's just a great, almost, I don't want to say Southern Bastards feel, but it kind of has that grittiness of, let's say, like a Southern Bastards. If you're a fan of that, make sure you check this out. But if you're interested in this, like Jay said, make sure you let your local comic book stores know that you want this because a lot of them might not be ordering this. And if you, said, if you can't get it there, like he said, check um, Comixology. Also, Mad Cave Studios website, they sell a lot of their books on there too as well, right? Absolutely. It's also where you can order uh, my next one, Hellfighter Quinn, coming out in March. Tell us about that one. Yeah, I love, I got to tell you, before you get into that book, the cover for that book. Um, in, in our YouTube uh, banner, I'm wearing a Muhammad Ali hoodie. I am a diehard Muhammad Ali fan. Um, and the kind of the homage to Muhammad Ali on that cover is incredible. Yeah, so are we getting like a Kumite? You mentioned Bloodsport. Yeah, there it's uh, very much like um, Mortal Kombat meets Highlander in a, a fantasy world where there's these five clans, but I really only had enough pages to write about four of them. So w- one of the clans is kind of like the Jan Brady of the group. We don't really mention <laughs> much. But um, yeah, there are uh, these five clans. They're fighting for an object of great power. Uh, I can't say a lot about that yet, but there are factions, there are agendas, there's politics, um, and there is a real um, one percenter kind of feel 
in the chief clan, you know, the, the queen's clan who has been ruling this tournament for the past 100 years, you know, to keep their power and not share it. And our main character, the Harlem Hellfighter, uh, Quinn, Quinlan Jones, he's a guy that really wasn't looking for the fight, but when the fight comes to him, he decides he's going to get, you know, the best shake he can for his people, and he, he's going to do it with all he knows how. This is all he knows. So, yeah, they told me I could really go as far as I wanted to in terms of violence and, uh, you know, the graphic nature and the language. So um, I, I think I like where it goes. You got some nice, um, some really nice art and really nice coloring. I think the coloring actually was what made the world. And I, I don't have, I have nothing but high praise for everybody on the team. And is this another six issue type volume arc? It'll be a yeah five issue volume arc. I actually got a few more pages in each volume than I did with Over the Ropes. They they gave me a little more um, leg room because uh, they were really enjoying how it was going, and they said, "Why don't you elaborate on this and give us another page here?" And I was, "Yes, please." <laughs> so there's um you know there's some other characters that are developed um, as we go, and I yeah I, I can't wait for you guys to read it. That's another thing we've talked about on this channel a lot before, especially with Indies and specifically Mad Cave, looking at all their titles. They come out in these volumes. People a lot of times look at it first off and think, oh, it's, you know, it's just a six issue miniseries. That's all it's ever going to be. But you've pro proven with um, Battle Cats is already on its second volume. We're supposed to be getting more of Knights of the Golden Sun. Um, we really, 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 really make, want to make sure we get more over the ropes. But you're seeing it now, and you're seeing a trend of this. We've talked about this just probably this past week on the channel where a lot of publishers or writers are writing it to like these seasons or arcs, or it's not just an ongoing, but it's always like almost written as if it's an episode, what do they call it, procedures, procedural shows? Yeah, I think the secondary comics market needs to stop looking at this as a negative. When we yep. see these series released in these five issue, um, with the term miniseries, I think is almost out of date. Um, yep. I think that this is a storytelling and a sales technique um, where, yes, I think it's made for some great stories because you can kind of go into different areas um, and kind of always come back to it. And we, we've heard it called the Mignola style, right? Because that's what Hellboy years ago was very popular for doing it that way but um also it just makes sense from a publisher standpoint because they can they can take a guy like jay and give him five issues and see how throw something out there it's why independent comics are able to put out comics because they can they can keep taking chances and see what sticks um but mad cave studios has great momentum um there's a lot of momentum behind their books i have i i'm gonna be optimistic i think over the ropes is gonna come back for another volume uh, I've heard nothing but good things about the book, so. I would like to come back and return more than The Undertaker. There you go. <laughs> if, they'll, if they'll let me. There you go. He's truly undead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've talked about Over the Ropes. We've talked about Hellfighter Quinn. Let's just kind of put the comics to the side, and we're going to talk current wrestling, right? Hoop J right now. Do you have a favorite wrestler? I probably have several. Um, I'm mainly watching AEW right now. I don't want to be unfair, though. So I'll give you, a, in WWE, I'm really liking um, Drew McIntyre, Kevin Owens, and uh, Ricochet. Our three guys that just really uh, I enjoy and would like to see rise to new heights. AEW, where uh, bringing on the Wednesday night delights. Uh, obviously, Cody Rhodes is a, an MVP, is really carrying the promotion, but they're careful not to shove him down people's throats. You know, they really threw me for a loop by playing a long game with giving him the title. That's going to keep people tuning in long term to see where this goes how will cody ultimately win the title when he does it's going to be pretty sweet 
Um, I already said that Chris Jericho is uh, my one of my all-time favorite lists, and uh, I think that he is performing better now than he ever has before. And probably the, the third man in AEW, um, I, there's more I could say, but I think I'll go with the bastard pack. Uh, just knowing what pack has uh, gone through to get there, where he's you know performed around the world, NXT, where he got his first big um, platform, you know, NXT champion, and you know had great matches there, and then WWE, he was miserable, you know, to put it mildly. Yeah, he had great success, but when he's having to lose to you know someone like Enzo Amore, you know. How you doing? Uh, not so great. I, I'm glad that he has landed um, on both feet, and he is also that kind of high flyer that I look for. Um, you know, some inspiration in with like Phoenix. So yeah, I, they are really firing on all cylinders. I, I'm loving it. I uh, I'm looking forward to watching the Jericho Cruise stuff. It would be pretty fun to be on that cruise. Yeah, and they just made the announcement that next year when they do the Jericho cruise and they tape AEW, they're going to do it live from the cruise. So that'll be interesting um, versus the tape delay that they're doing now. Also need to mention Brandy Rhodes, who I um, am loving her, her storyline, her promos. Um, obviously, she has a great look. And I, I did not expect there to be so much uh, depth in this Nightmare Collective, but it keeps me tuning in. And uh, her work with Chris Stratlander is great. I'm kind of hoping, I, I've got my eye on Stratlander as the next women's champion. Her alien gimmick is obviously <laughs> over with me big because I have loved science fiction for so long. And it's one of those things of why ask why, you know, you don't have to ask why because wrestling isn't real. You don't have to ask why this girl uh, is an alien. <laughs> oh, see, <laughs> and, <the> see <laughs> and I'm glad you said that. So this is my little five second rant is I wish we joke about like the undertaker being the undead. Right. And we've kind of, I feel like we've gone too far in the other direction. Now everybody's the same and everybody's not. Every now and again, a fun gimmick that works. Well, that's why I think The Fiend works. The Fiend works because it, it, if you suspend disbelief for five seconds and you look at it from, you made the Game of Thrones comparison earlier, and you look at it from that angle of like, I'm just watching enjoyable television, um, those things can work really, really well. So I agree with you. I think if you just don't ask why and you just enjoy it and sit back, sometimes those things can really, really work. Wasn't Same it with... In uh wasn't it in your in your book where um like you know it's fake right and the guy's like so is everything else you watch on television right. that was how yeah that was kind of how i opened it yes yeah. and and a lot of people told me they liked the opening because of that cuz um i had to decide how i would handle the kayfabe you know will i treat it as real or will i treat it as predetermined and the answer was a little bit of both so um there is you know he, Jesse Presley is really trying to hurt him, but they're still putting on a show. Um, so you feel the danger for Phoenix. The stakes are there, not just losing the match, but he can get hurt. Um, that's another great thing about writing a wrestling comic compared to the wrestling that you watch on TV every week is I can put my wrestlers through whatever I want and not have to worry about injuries. That's also why I want to see your, your, your book succeed because I'm going to take it to the next step. We often talk about um, independent comics getting optioned. The movie The Wrestler worked so well because it, it took people behind the scenes to show them what the wrestling world is like. And for us wrestling fans, it's not a surprise. But if you're not maybe a diehard wrestling fan, some of the things that go on, whether it's the climb, the decline, um, the politics. Uh, you the know, seclusion. Yeah, all of it that goes on in wrestling is so entertaining. There's so many stories to be told. I love the kind of crossover between wrestling and comics because I think the comics fans can relate and understand wrestling. If you're, if they, any fan who's a fan of uh, of comics in any form, if they give wrestling a chance, they're gonna find a character they connect to or you know a promotion that tells stories the way they like to have stories told. Um, but it it's one of those things where 
I really think that if we can ever get a movie fictionalized in the wrestling world where you can take those liberties that you can't take with real people and the real injuries because the, the finishes are scripted, but what goes on in that ring is very real. Um, some of the liberties that they take on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, those aren't fake get, welts. Right. You can't get away with that. So it'll be interesting to see. There's a, I think it's an HBO show. Uh, Stephen Amell's next project is a show called Heels. And it's supposed to be a wrestling show. So we'll see how that, that kind of. Man, I would love to get Stephen Amell a copy of Over the Ropes. I think he would like it. I, I definitely think he would like it. Yeah. Maybe we can get his attention somehow. Yeah, I don't we, know. we gotta do like, that. Hey. <laughs> you failed this city. Yeah. <laughs> so jack real quick what are your favorite wrestlers right now right now cody rhodes is by far my number one number two number three um i i go in spurts right so there's times where i'm watching somebody and i'm all into that i was full into like that dolph ziggler phase when he like cashed in money in the bank and all that i tend to like kind of not the top guy but that second guy um i don't really care heel or face um uh, and Cody Rhodes, though, I feel so grateful for the way – for him leaving, having kind of the balls to walk out of WWE, which he wouldn't have been able to do, right, if he wasn't Cody Rhodes, if he didn't have the dad that he had. That kind of gave him the, the – kind of the backbone to do it. But so many guys had come into that situation where it's so tough. Like, you go – to leave a company, you're in a, you're in a sport where there's only one company at a time. Um, and that where you can regularly make money, even guys in TNA are working second jobs. So you, you have to take that risk to leave and have it work out so well for him that now he is a, a vice president of a company. He's made so many jobs for so many other people on top of it. He's proven as a wrestler inside the ring that he's as good as it gets. And he's not as good as it gets in the, way that like a lot of people look at wrestlers today like he's not doing those big spots and he's not um he's doing kind of an old school style which is actually kind of cool because it's different and his match with Dustin Rhodes I think was his brother was my favorite of last year I thought it was a just a phenomenal match so right now he he's my favorite if if we're inside WWE which I don't really love everything that's going on I obviously I'm a big NXT fan um and and everything undisputed era but those were my guys in Ring of Honor as well. And of course, I watch, I'm the crazy guy who stays up uh, till seven in the morning watching Wrestle Kingdom, uh, at New Japan Pro Wrestling last weekend or the weekend before uh, the two night event. So um, I love my Japanese wrestling as well. And I love the way guys are now leaving and going over there. And John Moxley, Chris Jericho wrestled over there. That was, that was, that was real cool. Yeah, I'd say for me right now, I'm liking Jericho, but that's also because I haven't gotten too much in AEW. Of course, WWE, to be honest, I can't really stand Seth Rollins or Roman Reigns right now. Um, Jack knows I'm a big Braun Strowman fan. I like <laughs> the big guy. Let him eat, man. Um, Ricochet, of course, talking about high flyers. Love me some Ricochet. And um, one guy that I used to, I think I even told Jack this, one guy that I used to not really care for, but actually really love right now is I love AJ Styles. Like the whole great wrestler, but I love the promos and like the joking that he's doing with the OC. And if you're talking about being funny, freaking love me some R-Truth right now. Especially if you saw the promo he just did with Brock Lesnar. And then I'm going to go to Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls City. And thought he's Paul, awesome yeah and thought paul Heyman was gonna be in the royal rumble but um i agree with all your choices and then um finn balor all right and then one last time around just one who's your favorite female wrestler let's we'll start with jay if i have to all right if i have to say one i'm gonna give it to brandy rhodes um even though she's not a full-time wrestler she is wrestling um but she is uh wearing a lot of hats and doing it very fashionably. So right now I would say my favorite, uh, and my man Dan Pierce, he's going to be excited for this pick, but is Ayu Shirai from NXT. Um, she switched that gimmick up a little bit. And it, you know, a lot of people may not know this, but her uh, fiance is evil from um, New Japan. 
and she kind of switched up her gimmick to kind of match his and it's really really worked this kind of like evil dark um break all the rules do whatever you got to do to get to the top character has really worked especially when you can't speak the language so you can kind of sell that point without having to say a word mine is probably going to be the most i, I want to say cliche but most easiest and probably a lot of people picked but i'm going to say becky lynch and it's more instead of wrestling I just love her promos. Dude. She's like one of the best female wrestlers at shooting promos. <laughs> I wait for like I'd rather see her pick up the mic almost than and than watch wrestling. And normally it's the opposite. Normally I want to watch wrestling. I was like, man, quit the promos. Let's get some wrestling. But every time Becky Lynch picks up the mic, I'm like, oh, we're gonna get some some good stuff here. And she's just one of the best at it. Especially for I think Seth Rollins could probably learn something from it. Well, she's actually interesting because we've been talking about KFAB throughout the, the, the show. Last, what was it? Tuesday night, but last night on WWE Backstage, she was a guest and she was being interviewed by CM Punk and she's being interviewed by, um, by Renee Young. And she was struggling because it's a weird show because it's, it's kind of, it's backstage, right? They're KFAB light. Yeah it's, 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 yeah, it's supposed to be in both worlds per se. I was watching her do this interview and struggle. She didn't know how to do it, right? Because CM Punk, he, he's not a character on TV anymore, so he doesn't care. So he's asking backstage questions. She's wanting to answer the question honestly, but at the same point, stay in character. And watching her kind of struggle to navigate talking about being frustrated at certain points with the company or being frustrated with the women's evolution, but yet still try to stay as in character was, was really entertain, kind of entertaining. But I think she was struggling for a few moments. Yeah, because she kind of felt like, what, the fourth horsewoman that was left behind? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was moments where it looked like she wasn't going to um, make it on the main roster, where they may let her go at points. Um, so to go from that, she's an example of everybody gets, like, a moment, to, and then when you get that moment, you got to figure out how to, like, strike. The best thing that happened to her, though, was getting her nose broken. Getting her <laughs> nose broken by Nia Jax, getting that iconic moment. with the Yeah, blade. they still show that when she's up there just, like, don't phase me. Well, that's what CM Punk said. CM Punk said that that's one of like the top four or five most iconic like still shots in pro wrestling history. Um, and you'll never be able to take that away from her. Uh, and it just, it's just funny how that, that all happened organically. So you can script whatever you want, but you, things like that have to happen. Uh, if, if she didn't bust her nose like that, it's probably just another scrum at the end of Monday Night Raw that no one cares about. And no disrespect to the women's division, but especially coming out of the women's division. But instead, she gets her nose broken, goes up through the crowd, stands there with the crowd freaking out and blood pouring down. I mean, it was like the coolest thing you had ever seen, out of, a, especially out of a women's wrestler. Her walk, and her walkout music is still the ringtone on my phone. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, he's diehard. <laughs> but i don't have any like the man t-shirts or anything like that i'm not gonna go that far but yeah yet <laughs> i'm gonna get one that says the woe man i don't know yeah. but um so jay we want to take the time thank you so much for coming on and giving us the privilege of being able to speak to you speak to you about your book we love the book love the work you've been doing on it looking forward to hellfighter quinn and that short story book um before we go, is there anything else you want to tell our viewers? Anything you want to talk about? Uh, send me a follow, a like at uh, jsandlin underscore whn on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Go to my website, jsandlin.com, where you can sign up for my newsletter, where you can get uh, news, freebies, and keep up to date with podcasts I'm doing. Uh, Again, I've got Over the Ropes issue three coming out in February. Hellfighter Quinn is coming in March. And Space Police Files, my um, short story sci fi collection, is available now on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Yeah, you posted about that on Twitter the other day, and that, that, that feed just grew the amount of fans that were excited to get that book on Amazon. I hope so. <laughs> we'll see. It's been a little less than a week now, so I'm, I'm probably not going to look and see how anybody's downloaded or bought it for at least 60 days, probably. It would just be torture to sit in there and right. re refresh yourself. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it for a while. 
uh, other than just to tell people to check it out. I just want to go ahead and go on record and put Jay on the spot that we've got to bring him back as Over the Ropes comes to an end. Because especially after reading issue three, I want to talk to him about three, four, and five and hear all about how this story kind of ends and comes together. Um, and, and by then, we'll be able to talk about some Hellfighter Quinn. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Jay. we got to bring you back. It's got to be part one because um, we've got more to talk about. Yeah, and we uh, need an updated Easter egg list. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> but So thanks again, Jay. All the social media links for him will be in the description of this video. So you, it's easy for you to check that out and give him a follow. Definitely, like I said, check him on Twitter. Check him on Instagram. Check him on Facebook. And then check his website and sign up for his newsletter. This is Brian Jackson Men's Comics. Thank you again, Jay. And this has been another episode of the Indie Spotlight.